Welcome. I'm Pastor Mariah Tolgard, and on behalf of Hamlin Church, thank you for joining us for worship. I am delighted to be your host as we go through our service today and grateful that you are taking some time to join us to worship. Whether you are watching with us on Sunday morning or tuning in at another time, we are so glad that you are here and we are grateful that we can connect in these pandemic times through technology from wherever we are at. Just a couple of notes about our service today as we begin. I, I want to encourage you to follow along, if you'd like, with our worship guide that it will be posted in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube or on our live stream page on our church website, hamlinchurch.org. There you'll find the order of worship for today, as well as uh, information about events that are happening in the coming week and ways that you can serve and connect in this community. So I hope you will check that out. We encourage you to uh, participate in the comment section if you'd like, and would love to know that you're out there to have you say good morning, peace be with you, to share any prayer requests that you have. If you are watching on the website or tuning in at another time, we would love for you to fill out an online connection card. And you can click on the link that says, let us know you're here and there. Uh, fill out a connection card. That's an, also an opportunity to let us know how many folks are watching with you. And if you have any questions about Hamlin Church or any prayer requests, they can put, be put in there as well. We really would like uh, for folks to fill that out every week um, in no matter what format you're watching in. So please take a moment to do that. I, today we continue in our summer worship series, Prophetic Voices, and take a look at the prophet Hosea. There's only a couple weeks left in this series, and we will have accomplished getting through the 12 minor prophets. So I hope you have enjoyed this series, and I've uh, enjoyed learning about the prophets myself and leading you in it. Friends, we come to this space because we need worship. We need to connect with God. We need to connect our hearts, our minds, our lives to one another and to creation. And the act of worship helps us to do just that. So that is my invitation to you today. Let us open ourselves to the spirit, the holy divine spirit of love that unites us and let us worship. Lost 
Good morning. Welcome to Hamlin Church. I'm Heather Grantham, Associate Minister for Spiritual Formation, and I'm so happy to be with you all today. As you can tell, I am in the youth room, I'm in the fourth and fifth and sixth grade Sunday school room, um, missing you all. I miss seeing you here in person, and I've been thinking a lot about you all and wondering how you are how you are feeling, whether you be a student, a teacher, a caregiver, a parent, an auntie, an uncle, a grandparent, how are you feeling about the transition back into fall? We've had a long summer um, of quarantining and not our typical summer. And as we're looking towards the new school year, for many of you all, it's online. Um, it's very different that kind of it doesn't feel the same. How are you feeling about it? One of the things I know that I've been missing is the rituals of going and getting a brand new box of crayons or picking out a backpack or a lunchbox. I've been missing uh, wondering who, finding out who my kids' teachers are, what we're doing for the school year, have the ritual of getting up early and setting breakfast and getting routines all ready. They'll be switched a little bit, so I feel off kilter. One of the things that I like to do to help me during this time is to pray, um, is to set aside a special way to invite God to hear those feelings. I like to create an altar space, a very simple one of just a candle or a icon or I have paper to write down any type of prayers or what I'm feeling at the moment. I have an altar that I can lay down everything that I am feeling whether it be scared or anxiety or um, sadness or happiness, whatever emotion I'm doing, I lay here and I tell God about it. And that's what helps me as we're approaching this new school year and not knowing what will happen. The touchstone of coming to a place. I know we all miss the place of the church, but in your house, a place in your house, or an altar in your room, or just some sort of touchstone. I even carry something in my pocket that's elaborate that reminds you that God is with you, that the church is with you. Even though we're not here on Sunday morning sharing in our spiritual formation in the building, we are still with you here. We are together. We all have the same goal in sight, and that's loving our neighbors, creating a community that we all can be proud of and be in and that connection with God and one another. In these times of rituals being off kilter, know that that is still true. Say a prayer. Remember through lighting a candle that God is with us. And as you're making decisions and plans and new routines for the upcoming school year, know that we are too and we'll have an opportunity to see one another again, uh, to connect with one another, to learn about God together again. And in this time, know that we are with you and we love you. I thought for today, a way that we connect with one another is it's through prayer and we could even close with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer that you may remember, have memorized, your parents may have memorized, but the fun thing about the Lord's Prayer is that even Jesus said it. Jesus was the one who taught it to us. So as we're praying the words that you'll see come up on your screen and you can pray it together with me, remember that your ancestors and your ancestors' ancestors and people far as back as the founder of our faith, Jesus Christ, said these words. So will you please talk to God with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from ego. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, we are getting to the end of our Prophetic Voices Summer Worship Series. Next week, we'll take a brief detour when we offer a worship service put together by my colleagues here in the Minnesota Annual Conference. And then we come back on Labor Day weekend for one last prophet. As we start today, I wanna to give you a little bit of insight into what this process of preaching on the prophets has been like for me. Generally, when I start my sermon preparation, I read through the text, in this case, the, the whole book of whatever prophet we're focusing on. And often what happens is that on reading it, I instantly regret ever getting myself into this series. And I think, whose bright idea was it to preach on all 12 minor prophets? Hosea, on first read, definitely had me about ready to throw in the towel and preach on a nice and tidy story from the New Testament. You'll see why in just a minute. But as I pressed on, I had a change of heart about this prophet. First, the context. As I've mentioned, we've been jumping around historically. The last few weeks, we've been focused on the last of the minor prophets and the time period of the Jewish people's release from captivity in Babylon and return to Jerusalem to build the temple. And this week, we go back in time. Hosea is one of the earliest prophets. This is one of the oldest books of the Bible. Little is actually known about Hosea. Even when he is identified as the son of Barry, we don't know much more. He was prophesying to the Israelite community from 750 to 724 BCE. It was the period of the Northern Kingdom's decline and the fall in the eighth century. According to the book, the Israelites had largely turned away from God. In fact, they were even worshiping other gods and indulging in other sinful behaviors. Hosea blames the kings of this era for leading the people astray and for rejecting the teachings of God and he warns that their nation will be destroyed and that the people will be taken into captivity by Assyria, the most powerful nation of the time. And indeed, that is what happened. As the Northern Israelite kingdom fell to the Assyrians in 722. Now we've seen throughout this series, even with our jumping around in time, an ongoing narrative of the people turning away from God, the prophets warning of danger, of straying from God and reminding them of their ancestors and who had also separated themselves from God and how terribly wrong that went, and then continually calling them back to the God who loves them. For ancient Israel, history was not a mere recitation of events. It was a holy story. As the German theologians called it, a Hielsgeschicht, forgive my German, literally meaning salvation history. Hosea is part of the holy story, the ongoing salvation story of God in an ongoing relationship with the people of Israel. This book offers three metaphors in which the prophet tells how God's love and works with the world just as it is. Now this is where my frustration with Hosea comes in. You see, the first metaphor used for God in Israel was the marriage covenant. Born out of relentless love for Israel, God, the faithful husband, would not give up betraying his, give up on his betraying wife. In fact, the broken-hearted husband brought her home from the bars night after night continuing to love her and will her into being a good wife and mother. The story here is told as if it's Hosea and his wife, Gomer, a harlot as the scripture identifies her, likely not even based on a real person. Now, I was ready to stop right then and there. There are many examples of problematic portrayals of women in the Old Testament, and this is right up there with the worst. The message of God's relentless love gets lost in this problematic metaphor. 
which perhaps made sense to men at the time in a society where the relative worth of women was minimal to non-existent. But now we know that this story and others like it have been used for centuries to perpetuate harmful stereotypes against women and reinforce patriarchal views of marriage. Like I said, I thought that it was all I needed to hear from Hosea. And just going into all that would be likely a whole other sermon series to unpack the, this and other biblical portrayals of women. But then, when I kept reading, I came to our scripture passage for today. Here, Hosea has a second metaphor for God. As a parent who also loved relentlessly and fiercely a child who kept running from their love. Hear these words. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the balls and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt and Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The swords rage in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adama? How can I treat you like Zebim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. Hosea offers the most intimate account we have into the heart of a parenting God. This view of God's internal landscape cannot be more stunning. In the first four verses, God speaks in the first person using I nine times in the first four verses and 18 times in total in all 11 verses. And this is significant. When Israel was a child, God said, I loved, I called, I taught, I healed, I led, I lifted and nuzzled them to my cheek. I bent down. I fed them. I did all of this for them. These are very maternal images. God says, I did all this for you and you weren't even aware. Now, most of us can't remember our early childhood. We see photos or families, members tell us stories and we go through old photo albums and they say, this is when you were a baby and I held you in my arms. This is when you were crawling and this is when you took your first step and, and I was so proud. We go back to the photo albums or these day, perhaps the Facebook photo reminders or the this day in history feature on your phones. And we look at these as much for ourselves as for the child so that we too will be reminded when we reach those rough patches, just how much we love these children. Our parents did the same with us. As we heard earlier, God hit a rough patch and God is responding to Israel's adolescent rejection. 
Israel ran away from God to another God. Some of the Israelites even went back to Egypt, the very God-forsaken place from which God brought them out of slavery. And then there's a familiar litany. We perhaps heard it ourselves. I gave you life. I gave you a house and food and shelter, God says. I kept them alive during those years in the wilderness. I gave them a land to call their own, but they abused it all, mistreated their land and its people, and ultimately rejected me. God lamented, if you want to go back to that place that nearly destroyed you, fine, go. Then in the next verses, there is this most interesting moment. We see God's internal anguish and internal dialogue. You see, God, not even God, escaped the pain that all people have the power to inflict upon someone they love. But there is a dramatic twist in the plot of this story, a shock to Hosea's readers, to be sure. God's heart recoils within God's self. The word recoil is the same word used in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to describe how God overthrew the cities in their disobedience. In our story, God's heart recoils within God's self. God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, but in our story, God overthrows God's own heart. Instead of punishing the child, God takes the punishment unto God's self. The consequences of the child's painful actions are taken into the heart of God. And God's tender compassion is rekindled. They are God's children after all. They didn't ask to be chosen by God. God has different eyes to see them. God holds their yesterdays in pictures no one else remembers, waiting for them to be born, the moments of their childhood and all the big thresholds of their journey, in the wilderness, in the promised land, in life and in death, they belong to God. And so do you. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy them. I am not mortal, says the Lord. I can hold the tension of both anger and love in one hand. We are a part of the same story that Hosea wrote about. It's a story that is both ancient and new, and it always tells about how God loves and works with the world as it is. It's easy to think of the Old Testament as someone else's story and to think, geez, I am so glad that we don't live in those times. Imagine what it was like, the wars, the plagues, the conquering nations, the devastation of homelands, the toppling temples, the religious and ethnic power struggles, subjugated and abused people. Hmm. But you know, some of the names and places have changed, but the challenges of living together in this world clearly have not. The pandemic in particular and the last few years in general have made it more clear, more real, that we are a part of the same holy story that has been going on for millennia. I have found comfort and even hope in knowing that I, that we are a part of a bigger story. Their story is our story, and our story continues the holy story of a God who loves and works with the world just as it is, who loves and works with us just as we are. It is our Hilgeschkt our salvation history. As we live into the holy story in our individual lives and communally, God's love is constant, relentless, like a parent's love for a child, 
a love that is constantly at work in our lives and in the world, forming us, shaping us, saving us. A love that will not let us go. Even in this moment, when it seems that we are in a bit of our own dark and melancholic times, amidst the pandemic and economic stress, the political dysfunction and the deep hard work that comes with coming to terms with privilege and systemic oppression in all its forms. Even amidst the personal malaise we might feel in the dog days of August, the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness, the hurt and grief, the worries about health, concerns for our family members and friends. Even amidst all this, one day we will look back and see God's hand in this moment. We will know that it was that saving love that kept us going. That saving love that is with us each and every day. Yet sometimes we see it best in hindsight, like looking back on our childhood photographs. And sometimes we are lucky enough to catch a glimpse of it in the here and now and recognize it as such. We are able to recognize it as it comes to us in perhaps the beauty of a summer day, a walk outside, a chat with a friend, a good book, a good laugh, in the kindness of strangers, in the sacrifices we are making for one another by wearing masks and trying our best to stay safe and keep others safe. And most certainly we see it in the ways this church is being church, even we can, when we cannot be together in this physical church. You, my beloveds, are part of the holy story. And I invite you to reflect on in the week ahead and perhaps even now share with us in the comment section, if you'd like, what is saving you right now? What is calling you back, reminding you of God's love? Earlier this week, Kamala Harris posed the question in her speech at the Democratic National Convention. She said, years from now, this moment will have passed and our children and grandchildren will look in our eyes and ask us, where were you when the stakes were so high? But I think perhaps the bigger question will be, where was God? How did God's love carry us through this moment? How did God's saving love deliver us to the other side? Just as God does time and time again. Just as God did in Hosea's story and in Israel's story and in Jesus' story, God does the same in our story. We are living our part of the holy story. And God's saving love is here with us in this moment. And this too will become a part of our salvation history, told and retold for generations to come, of a God whose love will never let us go. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, my name is Greg Dolkin. I'm pleased to present this anthem from our Hamlin Church Choral Library. It's called Oh Love by Elaine Christensen and it's based on a work by 19th century blind Scottish minister George Matheson at a very dark time in his life. Um, his sister who had been his caregiver was, was leaving to be married, which of course is a joyful time, but he recalled his own uh, experience in which his fiance left him when she learned he was blind and could not be cured. So under these circumstances, he wrote these beautiful words. Uh, many thanks to Elaine Miller for her beautiful piano accompaniment. Oh, Lord. 
My thanks to Greg Dalkey for that beautiful musical offering. It was fun to hear him sing all of those parts. Greg, thank you for sharing your gifts uh, with all of us. Friends, we come now to the time in our worship where we are all invited to share our gifts. The act of offering in the worship service is a way to commit our intentions for the week ahead of how we will share our gifts, our time, our energy, our resources to the work of God in this world. One of the ways that we can do that and that we commit to doing that as a community is by sharing our financial resources to support the mission and ministry of Hamlin Church. We know that not everyone is able to give at this time and we uh, understand that uh, if you are able, we'd like to invite you to give generously as you're able. There are three ways to give. You can give on our website at hamlinchurch.org give. You can give by text or by mail. Thank you for your continued generosity. As we wrap up today, I just wanna draw your attention to a couple of more events and announcements. Again, check out the worship guide or your uh, weekly Friday email to see what is happening in the week ahead. Today, uh, if you are tuning in on Sunday, August 16th, there is a special social meetup happening at Ginkgo's Coffee Shop on the corner of Minnehaha and Stelling from 5.30 to uh, 7.30 for Hamlin Church folks just to come and, and get together for a cup of coffee or a bite of food and, and reconnect. And uh, we ask that everyone wear masks and practice physical distancing. Uh, when our thanks to uh, Kathy Sundberg for inviting us and uh, for committing a part of the proceeds from today to uh, Hamlin Church. Thank you and hope to see you there. Also, don't forget Taste of Hamlin and next Sunday, August 30th from 12 to 3, pick up your pre-ordered ham loaf and meatballs uh, here at the church and our thanks to the dining hall crew for helping to organize that. Uh, you see in the worship guide an opportunity to help uh, make dough for the big bread, break, bread bake that is taking place as part of that. So help out if you can. 
And friends, it has been such a blessing to worship together. I am grateful that you tuned in with us and that we have had this opportunity to listen to the call of God for our lives and for our community. Hear these words. Go into this day, listening for the prophets among us, proclaiming the love of our God most holy, and acting and giving and serving in the name of the love that is God, that connects us all, now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we go, a final amen from Greg Dalkey. And don't forget to join us for a Zoom coffee hour. The link is available in the comments. Blessings. Amen. Postlude is by the late Paul Mons, Twin Cities organist and composer, a lovely arrangement of O oh Love, How Deep. Mm -hmm.